Megan Ramos, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Thanks for having me on, Ben. It's really great to be here. I'm just a huge fan. Likewise, I love what you're doing. I love what your whole team is doing with the fasting method. And we'll talk about all of that. And we'll talk all things fasting on this episode. Uh, but before we get into that, you have a very powerful story. Um, and I'd love for you to go into your story and how you got on this journey towards healing yourself and now healing the world. <laughs> well, I come from like this horrendous gene pool. And well, your genes definitely aren't your destiny with you know, proper lifestyle intervention. I did not have a proper lifestyle. Um, so I, I, things hit me early on. I was 12 years old when I was diagnosed with fatty liver disease and 14 when I was diagnosed with PCOS. And my doctors couldn't figure it out because my BMI was really low. It was classified as underweight. But in hindsight, I was just a skinny little sack of fat. Like I was a little tofi. <laughs> I had no energy. So explain tofi. What's tofi? So I was thin on the outside, but fat on the inside. So lots of visceral fat, organ fat, you know, leading to inevitably type 2 diabetes in my case, uh, amongst many other health conditions. So, um, so my doctor's attitude was like, well, you're skinny. Like, why do you have diseases of obesity? It doesn't make sense. You'll grow out of it. Like, don't worry about it. Like, it doesn't make sense. It can't be you. You don't fit the criteria here. Um, so I tried not to stress about it, but like the whole PCOS and fertility thing really bummed me out at 14. I always wanted to be a mom. So it weighed really heavily on my mind, you know, going through my teenage years and into my early 20s. Um, my mom's medical history is horrendous, and I grew up sleeping on emergency room floors, and doctors were only ever treating her symptoms. No one was ever trying to figure out why she was so sick, and it took a very special doctor to actually spend a lot of time with her and figure out what the root cause or causes in her, con in her instances or her conditions were, um, and it made all the world a difference. So when I was really young, I wanted to get into preventative medicine. I had a keen interest in kidneys. Um, my dad had a good friend who was director of this massive nephrology, which is the study of kidney disease, so massive nephrology program. His kids wanted to shadow my dad for a summer job, so my dad said, well, I'll trade you kids. You know, my, my daughter is really interested in preventative medicine and you have a big research department. So I started at this nephrology group when I was 15 and I got lumped in with this goofy guy named Dr. Jason Fung. Um, he was fresh out of his nephrology fellowship and he had to do some research projects to prove himself to the nephrology group. And I was the student assigned to, to help him with those projects. So I started working with Jason when I was 15. And really just this keen interest in preventative medicine. By the time I was 25, I still <laughs> had been in the nephrology department for 10 years. I stuck through there um, with all my education. And I thought, gosh, this is depressing. You know, we have all this diabetic kidney disease. It's killing everybody. And as kidney specialists, we can't help them. Um, so from the time I was 15 to 25, we just saw this massive boom in diabetic kidney disease that didn't exist when I first started there. And I said to myself, okay, Megan, like you really need to get your health together. Grabbed a copy of the Canyon Food Guide, found the fanciest, most accredited dietitian in the country, um, paid her an arm and a leg, uh, conned my parents into getting me a fancy personal trainer, uh, and started doing everything by the books. And within a year, I had gained almost 80 pounds and I had developed type 2 diabetes. So that didn't work. Um, I, you know, Professionally, I was becoming really disheartened too um, because I knew all my, my patients in my research projects were trying to live life right and their diabetes was just getting worse. Uh, they were just gaining more and more weight. They were needing more and more insulin. And I felt so frustrated for these people because I was now living it too. I was doing everything right. I was getting worse. My doctors were rolling their eyes at me. Uh, I had a di the dietitian accused me of eating Oreos in my closet and lying to her and wasting her time. And I've maybe eaten like two Oreos in 35 years of my life. So I was really, really ticked off. Um, and Jason really had started getting into low carb, um, but didn't think it was the complete answer and, uh, and was just having really poor compliance with a handful of patients he was trying. And he was inspired by a friend of his who was fasting for religious reasons, spiritual reasons, and got some health benefits. 
And then we went through Ramadan and, you know, he noticed the trend. We have to take people off their medications because when they fast throughout Ramadan, uh, so Ramadan, holy month of Ramadan, people fast from sunrise to sunset. And it's a dry fast for about, you know, roughly eight to 14 hours, depending on the time of year. But he would see all of his patients get better and have to come off of medication. And then after Ramadan, have to go back on all of the medication. So, um, so he became really fascinated with fasting. And to him, it was the missing piece of the puzzle. So um, I started fasting after chatting with Jason. Uh, it made so much sense. You know, as a scientist, I went through all of the stages, like anger, hostility at my education, mad at my parents. They're brilliant people. Why, why weren't they asking these questions? Or, you know, why wasn't I asking these questions? I went through all the emotional swings because it just made so much sense. Fasting made so much sense. So I started fasting, I started transitioning my diet um, to low carb and then to ketogenic. And within six months, I'd lost over 60 pounds. I brought my A1C down to 4.6. I had no more fatty liver and I had no more uh, symptoms associated with PCOS, no signs um, of PCOS. And that was about a decade ago. So flash forward a decade, I've, I'm down 86 pounds. Um, I've uh, shifted my body composition for the better. Um, feeling good. I still have some some adrenal issues, um, but I've been able to, you know, sort of manage that without requiring steroid therapy, which is really helpful. Wow, that's quite the journey. And uh, you've been with Dr. Fung since you were 15. Um, that, yeah, that's 20 years. <laughs> 20 years. So you, your journey is amazing. And I, and I love that both you and Dr. Fung were, were kind of at the forefront of fasting and how powerful it is, especially in a clinical setting. And now it's worldwide. It's very popular now, but you were at the forefront and you talked about Ramadan. That's very interesting to me because I don't know if you know, know this, but my parents are, are Muslim. My mom and my dad immigrated from Iran. So they would teach Ramadan every single year. And I, and I did a little bit of it when I was younger, but I, I stopped kind of following it. But my mom always stuck with it. And growing up, I used to say, mom, you can't do this. This is so unhealthy. What are you doing? And now I'm like, yes, Ramadan is coming up. I know my mom's going to dry fast. It's going to be so good for her health. And it's a complete 180 because I know how healthy it is for the body. We'll talk all about that, but I just wanted to put that in there. And you said your A1C dropped to 4.6. How high was it? It was 6.4. So I was never outrageously high. But that um, was type 2 diabetic. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then sort of growing up in nephrology, we started getting all these patients coming in at the age of 40, not really like obese, probably to like topies, but, um, and they were having uh, like early kidney disease and we couldn't figure it out. And their A1Cs would be like 5.6 and 5.7. So we'd biopsy them, and the biopsies always came back diabetic nephropathy, diabetic kidney disease, with what is considered to be like pre-diabetes or, or like not even di diabetic at 5.5. Um, so, I mean, by the time you get to an A1C of 6.4, I think your body's already in a bit of trouble. I've seen how much damage healthy A1Cs um, can do to the body at like 5.5 or 5.6. How did you, what was your suspicion that this patient had kidney disease or some sort of kidney dysfunction? What are some things you ask or some symptoms you pay attention to? So the, these particular patients, they're younger um, and they would come in and their creatinine levels would be high. Uh, so their overall kidney function, their estimated filtration rate of their kidneys, glomerular filtration rate or EGFR, um, was low and it didn't make sense. And then another thing was that they were starting to leak a lot of protein into their urine, but they didn't have high blood pressure. Um, so there are these, those major things, the protein in the urine was sort of a big thing that, okay, there's probably some diabe diabetic thing going on here. Um, but then it never really made sense because the A1C and fasting blood sugar level were considered normal by standard range. So we would biopsy them since they were young and healthy. And sure enough, it would come back that the kidneys were quite damaged. And that's why they were leaking the protein in the absence of high blood pressure. Mm. And you said something really key there. You said their, their levels, their A1C and their glucose, fasting glucose, was averaged by standard reference ranges, but not necessarily by the functional optimal ranges that we look for. 
Yeah, it's it's pretty wild um, now. Like our our current reference ranges were made, you know, based on uh, assessed in a population who are all living a poor lifestyle and you know are pretty much you know in north america you have insulin resistance until proven otherwise you yeah. know like um so it's really poor data so actually a friend of mine did lab work recently for something that's not in my particular field of or interest or not interest but specialty and she sent it to me and i said i only know how to interpret this by standard practice by what i was taught in school so I said, you're better off finding someone who specializes in it because even though your lab says normal all the way down, I don't know. It's like fasting insulin levels. We use picomoles per liter here in North America or in Canada, and like normal is like 40 to 180. If you got insulin levels of 180 picomoles per liter, like you're type two diabetic, like you got severe metabolic syndrome. And we like to get our patients, you know, to 20 or under um, for their fasting insulin levels. And that, that would be considered type 1 diabetic by standard reference range, which is just mind-blowing. So it, it's really tough even when it comes to assessing, like, thyroid function and T3 levels. There's, like, the ideal range, and then there's the, you know, if you're an actually healthy person eating a healthy diet, and hormonally balanced, this is what it, what it is. So it's, it's such a hard time to be a clinician uh, because there's just like, we have, we have so many guidelines we need to go back and revisit. I was working with Diet Doctor a couple of years ago on creating reference ranges for people that follow a low carb or ketogenic diet based on all of my clinical experience with Jason. Um, because you know, you'll see someone on a ketogenic diet that has high urea levels, but otherwise normal kidney function levels. So does that mean that they have kidney disease? No, it just means for the person on the ketogenic diet, it's normal to have higher urea levels. And throughout human history, we probably had higher urea levels. We just didn't do start documenting it until the last 40 or 50 years to come up with these reference ranges. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. I, I also see that with triglycerides. Sometimes they go up before they go back down because the body's yeah. breaking down fat. And that's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. So yeah. it's so important to understand this, but the conventional approach doesn't really, they're, they're, they're kind of stuck in their, their box. Uh, but we'll, we'll continue getting the word out. You're doing a good job at, do, uh, at getting the word out. You had mentioned you were doing uh, standard care of practice. You and Dr. Fong, you were treating the symptoms, but it was already so far advanced, the kidneys, the failure of the kidneys that you weren't able to do much besides maybe a transplant or something like that. And then you realized that you could actually be ahead of the curve and teach them what to do to prevent this and be proactive and not reactive. I love that. And, and when was that light bulb moment that, that switched that, oh my gosh, I got to actually be proactive here and not reactive to, to what's going on with the symptom. So my whole life, I wanted to figure out how to help patients be proactive. And around the time I turned 25, I realized that our system was terribly broken. Um, broken, you know, maybe beyond repair, like it was going to take something really radical to fix it. And I actually was deferred going back to school for medicine to do my LSATs because it became so depressing just watching people die and being like, here's another tablet, here's another tablet. And especially like with the kidney function, because as the diabetes gets worse, there's something you can do for the kidneys. Um, so I lost hope. Like I, I lost hope in the standard, uh, standard care. I didn't know what to do. I felt really lost as someone who wanted to become a practitioner, someone who was a researcher trying to work in preventative medicine. Uh, it just seemed like there was no such thing. And then when I got sick, and I was talking with Jason and I started fasting and I started cutting out the junk and then, you know, trying to regulate my carbohydrates. Like I felt alive for the first time in my life. And I realized that, oh my gosh, like there's hope for these people. And, you know, I would go into the clinic and I'd see patients um, for research study visits and they'd say, oh my gosh, you know, you're coming back to life. Like we watched you like, grow up and we watch you start to die in your 20s and now we're watching you come back to life you know in your 30s or well, late 20s and um, 
And I said, what are you doing? We want to do it. So Jason and I you know, begged our colleagues to say, okay, let us try fasting with some people. Look, it hasn't killed me. Look at how better it's made my life. And they all saw how sick and how much I was suffering. So we started fasting with the patients and it was just so inspirational. We had an initial pilot of eight patients and within one month they were all off of insulin. And it was just like, oh my gosh, like these are people that I've, I've literally knew some of them since I was 15 in the wow. nephrology department. And these are people that I've watched and I even told that there was no hope for them and that they were going to need dialysis or they're going to need transplants because the diabetic kidney disease is going to get them in the end. And here we were reversing their diabetes and we were limiting the progression of their kidney disease and dialysis and transplants maybe weren't in the cards for them. And it was just like, okay, like, yeah, you know, I didn't know it. <laughs> life just happened so quickly. And then, you know, I, I had been deferring going back to go to medical school. And one day Jason said, don't do it. Like just, he says, it's going to take 50 years for the system to get fixed and something radical to happen. And he's like, let's just do this. Like, I don't want you to go back. Let's just do this together. And, you know, when the time comes, we'll be teaching, you know, the future generation of doctors, um, you know, what healthcare actually should be. And I just like, I discarded uh, going back to school. I said to my husband, who is my fiance at the time, like, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know if we'll be living in my mother's basement. <laughs> um, but I've got to do this because like every day you go to work and you make it's like one person's life better. And that person goes out and changes the mind of one doctor who then you know, changes the lives of 10,000 patients that they're going to see over the course of their career. And that those patients are going to infiltrate the population that way. And you're going to be able to revive people with hope again. So it's just been so wild for Jason and I to watch this unfold because when we first started talking about fasting, people thought we were lunatics. I said, you know, we're not inventing the wheel here. We're just bringing it back. Mm -hmm. right? And we're just bringing it back. And we started just sharing you know, notes from Elliot P. Johnson, the you know, founding like father of type 2 diabetic you know, medicine standard of care back in like 1916 was talking about the benefits of intermittent fasting for type 2 diabetics. And I think we were saying was revolutionary. Um, we were just trying to bring it to the forefront again. And people thought we were nuts. And it's just been so wild to see it gain so much acceptance and make such a great change uh, in people's lives. It's just been a really, really wild decade for us. Yes, it has. And it's just getting started. I mean, there's still <laughs> so many people who need this information. Fasting is my favorite tool in the health toolbox, personally. I, I absolutely love it, and um, it's made a big difference for myself and the keto campers as well. And I want to get into all about, all about fasting, and I have a lot of fasting questions for you, but going back to what you were saying about the type 2 diabetes, it's unfortunate that a lot of conventional doctors and dietitians and nutritionists are not looking to reverse the disease they're looking to treat it and manage it and that's what it used to say or i don't know if it still does but on the american diabetes association website it would say um we cannot reverse it but it, we could we could manage it and we could have you help help you have a quality of life with this disease and that's not really uh, a genius mindset as i call it because einstein said it best intellectual solve problems geniuses mm -hmm. prevent them so what you're doing what dr fung what your whole fasting method team is doing is you're, you're geniuses, obviously, but you're empowering other people to be geniuses because nobody dies from diabetes. They die from the degeneration of it, from the kidney disease, from the heart disease. And I saw it take my dad's life and I didn't understand it back then. And I understand it now. So this conversation is so important. If you are diabetic, type 2 diabetic, I'm talking about, and you, or you know somebody who's type 2 diabetic or a family or a friend, they have to listen to this episode. It could, it could, steer them in the right direction that could change their life. So I encourage those listening or watching on YouTube, please share this with somebody you know who has this lifestyle disease that is treated with medication. I mean, that's a huge mismatch. So getting to fasting. Fasting is a very, very powerful tool. And I tell people all the time, a chainsaw is a very <laughs> powerful tool. It could get the job done or it could hurt you. You got to know what you're doing and you teach people how to do it. So let's talk about fasting. What are some of the pitfalls you see when somebody does fasting the wrong way? How, how do you do fasting the wrong way? What are some negative consequences that could come from fasting? I think the most 
common things that I see are issues with electrolyte imbalances. Um, most people are just petrified of salt and they don't realize throughout most of human history, we were taking 4,000 to 6 milligrams of sodium a day for, you know, for optimal health and civilizations went to war over salt because it was so critical to our survival and well-being. So there's just this big paranoia about it. Everyone thinks it's going to drive up their blood pressures, which it does for some people, but it's a very small percentage of the population. So. Um, so for newbies, for people who are new to fasting, um, their insulin levels are so high, they start to fast, they start to burn through glycogen, they start transitioning into a state of ketosis and then burn body fat, and their insulin levels just tank. They bottom out, it forces them to urinate out all kinds of excess water, it might cause diarrhea, and they're not rehydrating properly. Um, so you know, for someone who is not a newbie faster, do you need to be as diligent or as concerned, or if you didn't take any salt that day, is it really that critical? And the answer is like, no, not if you're not a newbie faster, but if you're a newbie faster and your insulin levels are high, you need to be more mindful of electrolytes. And I still do consultations online and 99% you know, of the time it's a, someone coming to me and their issues are literally remedied with salt or maybe magnesium. Um, wow, that's pretty so high percentage. It, it's really wild. So I feel like an idiot, you know, uh, because I'm there and I'm like, oh, you need to take salt. And, you know, like I, I know I give specific advice for women at different stages in life. Definitely if you're menopausal or postmenopausal or perimenopausal, you actually need a lot more sodium if you're not sensitive to it. So there's timing of it and how much you should have and different methods for taking it. But I'm, I'm sitting there like this, talking to them, Ben, and they look at me like, is this woman for real? Like, did <laughs> we just sign up for this? And then, um, so then I feel terrible. But then two weeks later, I get an email saying like, oh my gosh, like that made a huge difference. And I said, you know, we just wanted to do it to email you and say it didn't work because like, how could it be that simple? Mm -hmm. And, um, but it's, it's really important, especially found for women more so than men, um, and especially sort of, you know, when you're, you're going through uh, the change of life, um, you need to be a lot more diligent with it too. So people, when they start, they um, are not really compliant with it. And it doesn't have to be salt water, it could be pickle juice, it could be bone broth. Uh, I know with bone broth, um, it's gonna limit autophagy, but you know, you're learning, fasting is a big change for a lot of people. Um, you don't learn how to ride a two-wheeler bike. You start off with a tricycle. You have training wheels. And then when you get the hang of it, then you take off the training wheels and you move into the, the big kid bike. And that's the same thing with fasting. It's like lifting weights too, you know? Um, I would very much like <laughs> to deadlift 300 pounds, um, but I had to start off at like 30 pounds to make sure I had good form and that I wasn't gonna hurt myself. And then, you know, I did hurt my hip and then it was figuring it out. Now I can slowly, now that I know what I'm doing, work my way up to my desired goal. Um, so being diligent with the sodium, I think is the most important thing for newbie fasters. Um, for more advanced fasters to that, like to do longer fasts, they tend to ignore electrolytes at the start of their fast and think that it's more important towards the end of their fast. So like if someone is doing a five day fast or a seven day fast, they're like, oh, I'll think about you know pickle juice or I'll think about salt water like on day four where it's actually the first few days where your insulin levels are gonna drop the most, you're at the most at risk for having uh, depleted electrolytes, and that's what you need to hydrate the most. It's much more important than on day four or day five. Um, and then another thing too is like, people really carb up sometimes, because life happens, I get it. Um, before but the then fast, they feel, you mean? Pardon? Oh, they carb up before the fast, is that what you're saying? Yeah, so they'll um, they'll like go out on say on Sunday night, and then they'll end up eating pizza, and then they have feel bad, and then they eat a bunch of carbs, and then they think, okay, 
tomorrow I'm going to fast. Like they're punishing themselves by introducing a fast after eating all of this junk food. Um, but what they've done is they've retained a lot of water through eating that junk food. So then when they go to fast, they lose all that water, they get depleted of electrolytes, they feel nauseous, and then they start to form this negative relationship with fasting. And fasting becomes a punishment, not this amazing lifestyle tool. So that's the second thing is, you know, if you do carb up, the best thing to do is something like a fat fast or like a really like low carb, you know, keto day or maybe a carnivore day if you like mixing in carnivore once in a while. Uh, and so you keep the carbs really low, lose that water weight by replenishing your electrolytes through food that day and through salt on food. And then the day after, a couple days later, then do your fast. But like don't carb up and then punish yourself with a fast. Physiologically, it wrecks habit and then mentally it wrecks habit too. I've seen so many people get into this negative mind, like fasting then becomes a punishment and then they can never bring themselves to do it. And fasting should be something that gives you time back, gives you energy. You know, it, fasting is supposed to provide you with so many wonderful things. It should never be a punishment. So don't put yourself in a state where you're going to fast and put yourself at like high risk for experiencing all these like keto flu like symptoms, you know, eat keto for a day or two. You're still going to feel maybe a little bit woozy depending on where you are in your journey of recovering from insulin resistance but it's better than trying to just jump in and say i'm going to do a three-day three-day fast after a weekend of eating like garbage totally yeah you wouldn't be a couch potato for 10 years and say oh i'm going to do a crossfit workout tomorrow right like you said yeah. fasting is a muscle you develop it sometimes you got to use these crutches these training wheels like a fat fast mm -hmm. i agree sea salt i put in my coffee uh, I'm taking magnesium and potassium. And also another thing is if they do carb up and then decide to do a fast the next day, they're not going to get autophagy as fast as if they went into it in a low carb ketogenic state because they would deplete those, those sugar reserves much faster and then enter autophagy much faster. Yeah, that's right too because you're not even going to be burning body fat for the majority of the day that you're fasting. You're just going to be burning through caloric glycogen. So it's better just to do it through a ketogenic diet. Then, you know, a day or two later, jump in, do a fast, and then reap all those wonderful benefits where you'll spend most of the time too, you know, actually burning body fat, which is what so many people are trying to do with fasting. How many, so your first pilot group was eight people and you said all of them or most of them got off their insulin, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Since then, and if you could give me like an estimation, you, Dr. Fong, the whole entire fasting method, how many people would you estimate that you've put on a fasting protocol? Over four, oh, just over 14,000. Oh my gosh, 14,000 people. Yeah, it's been wild. <laughs> it's been a while. So I think Megan knows a thing or two when it comes to fasting. What, are there any other, what, what's been the most surprising benefit you've seen out of the 14,000 people with fasting? Um, so there's been a whole, whole whack load of interesting things. Um, I love it when the, the older ladies get their libido back and they like sharing <laughs> with one another. Um, but the most surprising thing is, is anti-aging in women. Um, we have women coming in where they've like gone gray, but their like roots are coming in their natural hair color. And it's just like the most wild thing to see. Like I've had women near hyperventilating because they don't understand what's going on and they'll come in and they'll have like brunette roots, like the hair and the rest will be like white. And they're like, what is going on? Or like a woman in their like 76 year old woman getting a regular menstrual period for like two years uh, and just feeling on top of the world again. There's nothing more interesting than talking to a 76 year old or a 78 year old about what's the latest in like birth control, uh, <laughs> contraception. Wow. Um, but these things happen. So that, that has sort of been like the, the wildest thing. You know, these women would come in and they would say that they had, had a period and it's like, okay, there's all kinds of hormonal shifts going on when you're fasting and burning fat and your body's releasing estrogen. So got it, you know, things are gonna, gonna change. Um, but I thought it only ever would be short lived. 
Um, we're going on like three, four years in some cases where women are having like every 28 days, no medication, no bioidentical hormones, nothing. And they're having regular periods every 28 days in their 70s. And that is a pretty wild thing. Um, so you really are seeing the anti-aging benefits, which is just totally wild. That's super cool. Yeah, one of the members, uh, Deborah. Shout out to Deborah if she's watching or listening in my Keto Camp Academy. She just posted actually, I think today or yesterday, that her hair, some of her gray hair is going away, and she, her, she was so shocked by it. And I'm like, wow, that's a great testimony. Testimony. So I love that you shared that. Should women practice fasting differently than men? You just have to be more diligent with sodium. Uh, it's really important. Not quite sure why. Jason and I have a few theories. Um, I'm, ex I'm writing a book that will be published next year called uh, Woman and Fasting. So I'm going to run through mine and, mine and Jason's theories. Still doing some research, but salt seems to be super critical, particularly in middle-aged women. Um, for not necessarily feeling good, but for making sure that weight loss um, is happening at an efficient rate uh, rather than just being slow. So, um, so that's one, I think that is a really, really important thing. Women do need to fast more than men. Um, that's pretty much the bottom line to get sort of the same results. I rarely find a 24 hour fast in like a postmenopausal diabetic woman who's done a, or has a long standing history of calorie restriction diets, you know, for 10, 20, 30 years, um, get tremendous results doing fast shorter than 36 hours. Like sure. They'll start off at 24 will drop water weight, they'll lose some body fat, but eventually we hit a wall before they reach their goals. So I always just like to speak to them in consultation saying that, okay, you know, we might, we're, we're aiming to do a 36. That's our target fast. And we'll listen to your body. We'll go at your body's rate. You know, of course, if a woman or a man has a history of gout or acid reflux, we the fasting journey is always slower to start just to avoid issues with reflux and a gout flare up. Um, what I found with women though, is a lot of the time they prefer to fast for three days straight rather than do intermittent fasting. And if you look at some of the data, Jason wrote a blog post about this, it's up on our website, but it's, I think it's called like woman in hunger, but, but I, the, around the 36 hour mark, women's ghrelin levels like tank and they bottom out by 72 hours. Whereas with men, you still see more of like a cyclical cycle of ghrelin for over the course of three days. So we find that women, it's, they're more compliant doing a three-day fast for that reason, because once they get through the first day and they wake up the next day, there's 36 hours and it, there really is no hunger. And it just gets easier and easier for them Whereas they're constantly like every other day trying to do it. They say it's really tough mentally for them to bounce back and forth like that when they can just stay in a fast and know that it will be easier. So I tell a lot of women this too, when I see them in clinic or in consultation, you know, like let's try the, the intermittent fasting um, because it's generally a little bit more easy to fit into one's lifestyle, especially if you've got kids or a spouse at home or a partner that you have, um, have regular meals with. They might be caught off guard at first if you're not eating with them for three days straight. But I let them know that most women generally like to go into a, sort of a three-day fast. So their intermittent fasting is like three days on, four days off, three days on, four days off, rather than every other day. Um, so that is a strategy that I found works really, really well for women. So when you say four days off, they're, they're not even doing intermittent fasting. They're having breakfast, lunch, and dinner type of thing? So with them, it's usually 16. I, I don't, Jason and I don't consider a 16 hour fast to really be a fast. Like that should be the bare common minimum. sense, standard eating day. Got it. Okay. Makes sense. So what would you do if somebody comes to you, and I'm sure you get this all the time, uh, and they have been stuck at, at a certain weight, they lost, you know, 20 pounds and they have another 20 to go and they've been doing intermittent fasting. They've been doing a ketogenic type of diet. They've been doing, let's say, uh, 18, six schedule of fasting. What advice would you give this person who's just stuck at this certain weight? 
So, well, of course, we always take a look at the diet too, making sure that there's no problem foods, that there's no snacking um, going on to a lot of people we find on keto, they'll eat a lot of nuts and eat a lot of cheese outside of eating windows. Um, so we try to go back to their eating days and say, okay, what do they look like? Are you eating from noon to 8 p.m.? Or are you eating lunch and are you eating dinner? And if you are eating in between, you know, how can we add that fat and that protein um, to your other meals to make them more satiating so you don't have to snack between meals? And sometimes just that alone is enough to break a person through a plateau. Um, that's, because, that's because if they're snacking in between their meals, they'll spike insulin and be in a fat storage state. It's con yeah, it's constant stimulus. So in order to develop insulin resistance, you need a constant stimulus and you need high levels of insulin. So a lot of people say, well, I'm not eating the carbs anymore, so I'm not secreting these high volumes of insulin. But regardless of what you're eating, you're still gonna secrete some insulin. And if you're eating all day long, you're constantly spiking it. So the power of eliminating snacking is huge because by career default, I end up working with a lot of dialysis patients. And you know, dialysis patients have severe fluid restrictions. They've got all kinds of electrolyte issues at the kazoo. Like we really, you know, just to be careful, we don't want to be fasting them much more than 24 hours. Um, so what do we do? And we have to be diligent with our eating windows. And it might take a little bit longer, but if we can get them eating and eating windows and not snacking between meals, you know, we, they can get the same results as people who are regularly doing 36 or 42 hours of intermittent fasting because they're keeping their eating windows really tidy. Most of the people that come to the fasting method um, for help, they're doing amazing ketogenic diets, like all real food, no fake food, no processed garbage. Like a lot of them you know, have come to the point where they've given up sweeteners, like they're eating beef and salmon and eggs and hard cheeses and, you know, uh, broccoli, like they're, they're eating real food, macadamia nuts and raw organic almond butter, but they're not, they're eating all day long. Or for that, you know, eight hour eating window, they're eating for the whole eight hours and they already have some degree of insulin resistance. And insulin resistance itself will drive the insulin levels up. And then your eating habit of grazing for that eight hours will provide the constant stimulus. So you are getting high levels of insulin still through that insulin resistance, even though you're not eating the bagel or the cereal or the pasta or the potatoes. So <laughs> those eating windows are really important to limit the stimulus. Um, that alone is huge. Like, I think if we just all stop snacking, like we would immediately see this massive reduction in obesity and metabolic syndrome. And it's terrifying. One in five adolescents in the United States has prediabetes and like just cut out the snacks. Like when my um, grandmother went to school, there was no snacking. When my dad went to school, there was no snacking. You know, there was no obesity for these people until much later on in life. Um, but you've got kids nowadays, you know, Jason's talking about um, how his kids are f essentially force fed at breaks in between classes. And some of my colleagues like Nadia Padaguana, um, her daughter's in school too. Like there's, as soon as they show up, they give them bread and juice in the morning. Like, and this is after they've already had breakfast and before school starts. It's just wild what they're doing to children nowadays. So so it's just, a, it's a really <laughs> crazy thing. So getting rid of the snacks is critical. Um, and then if someone is doing a 16 hour fast and they're feeling good, I would encourage them to try to increase it to 18 and then 24 hours. And then at the 24 hour mark, rip off the band-aid and try to do maybe one or two 36 hour fasts a week for a period of time, maybe two or three months see what the results are, uh, and then you can sort of predict how long from there it's going to take you to reach some of your target goals. Yeah, what you shared about the one in five adolescents, it's ridiculous. It's got enough is enough, right? I mean, I believe in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see a trend in the right direction with the work that we're doing and the internet and the work that's available to so many people. So I think that it's a disgusting 
trend and stat, but I don't see it going continuing that direction. I, I, I see it going in the right direction within the next five to 10 years. I really do. Um, okay. Fasting. What is your favorite benefit of fasting? <laughs> For me, I think it's the uh, energy that I get while I'm fasting. Um, I've, I travel a lot for work. I have so privileged to go around and train doctors and other healthcare providers and speak at medical conferences. Um, so regardless of how I try to do my best when it comes to eating on the road, um, you know, even the other day I was, or recently when I was traveling, I was actually in Florida and I ordered a lovely steak, but I just washed some squeezed vegetable oil all over the grill. Mm. So I find that when I eat out, um, when I travel, it's tough. And I always come home and I feel inflamed and I feel really groggy. So I'll come home from a trip and I'll do like a fat fast for a couple of days. And then I'll jump into a fast. And I love how it just gives me that sort of energy reboot and that mental clarity that I need. And I start to feel human again. Um, so for me personally, I really love the energy. Um, when I was diabetic um, and obese, I, sh I sure loved my lab test results um, and my weight loss, but for something that was really important for me back then was the mental clarity. Um, if uh, you read my report cards throughout school, Megan is the most attentive student. Megan is, always participates in class, uh, so on and so forth, all throughout school. And then I got into university and I started to feel like I was handicapped or mentally impaired and I couldn't focus. I was the doodle queen on my notebooks. Professors used to get mad at me because I'd sit in the front and I was clearly not paying attention, but then I'd score really high on my tests. Like I once got over 100% on an exam that the entire class totally bombed. The class average was in the high 30s. And my professor was really irritated at that because she said, you come, you sit front and center, you, you doodle, you pay no attention to me. And she's like, how did you do this? Like, you did, like I know you didn't even cheat off of anybody because no one in the class even got close right. to where you are. <laughs> and she said, you have ADHD. And so I went through the whole rigmarole of getting diagnosed and then, you know, getting put on an Adderall. And then finding that I needed Adderall to actually be able to focus like I could in high school and in elementary school. And I felt like I had become this like drug dependent person and I didn't like it. And then Adderall and then Vyvanse, I tried to switch to that because it had less side effects, but still um, it wasn't great. You know, you're up all night. It's it mellowed out my personality. My friends didn't enjoy spending time with me. Uh, my boyfriend at the time thought I was being weird and, and didn't like me on it. But then I felt like I couldn't function in life. And I felt like I was on the fast track to dementia, which I probably was mm -hmm. because of my diet. Um, but I'll never forget. Um, I, I was, it was the end of the work year. I hadn't gone back to my psychiatrist to get my new dosage, or not new doses, but new prescription of Ivance. And I realized I was in the clinic and I thought, gosh, like I, I haven't been on it for three months. And then I started to think about all of the work I've done in that three months, all of the literature reviews that I stayed up all night doing, all of the personal adult stuff, you know, that <laughs> I don't, don't like doing. That's paperwork. Um, I did it all and without any drugs. And that was the first time that I had ever, like I had been able to do that in about five or six years. And I think it was really just the mental clarity from fasting. And I had realized, I was looking at my calendar and I was like, I always wrote in fasting on my busiest days. Cause I, not just because it was easier to fast if you're busy, but because I'd be more mentally sharp and focused. And it took that whole realization that day for me to realize that I had been doing this habitually. You got a presentation, you need to fast that day so you'll be sharp and focused. And uh, I hadn't put two and two together. I hadn't really connected it in mind, my mind. I'd just become a habit to do that. So that's been really cool for me. I love that. That's also my favorite benefit. And when I'm talking, when I'm giving a lecture, I, I'm making sure I'm fasted because I'm just going to be on top of my game. And, and the physiological reason for that is the counter regulatory hormones. Our body thinks, oh, there's no food in our environment. It's been 16 hours, 24 hours. 
let's pump this body full of energy, right? Raise these, the sympathetic tone and raise these counter regulatory hormones and give the human body all this energy, all this focus to go out there and hunt, right? And go kill our next meal, but we're going to use it to crush our day. And I think yeah. it's one of the best hacks you can have, especially if you're an entrepreneur or you're somebody who has a high demand or high workload and you want to function at a high level, any human being could use that benefit, but especially if you're an entrepreneur. So I'm with you, Megan. I love that benefit. <laughs> okay. So I have a couple more questions for you. We have a little less than 10 minutes to go. I want to make sure I ask these questions. How important is it to feast when you are eating? And when I say feast, healthy food, but how important is it to actually eat and feast and remind the body that it's not starving? It's really important to like when you're eating, eat. Uh, and eat until you feel satiated and try to eat a variety of foods. I see a lot of people more so over the last few years that are two creatures of habit with their diet and then don't eat enough. They're mostly women who have a long-standing history of calorie restriction diet. So in the past, if they didn't, if they ate to satiation, they always gained weight, but they're eating bread to satiation or or pasta to satiation, foods that would make them gain weight. You know, when you're eating an amazing steak or when you're eating fish or you're, you eat four eggs, like, and you feel full, you know, that, that kind of satiation is actually going to be quite helpful in you achieving weight loss. But a lot of people are terrified to eat until they feel full. So, you know, I want um, all of the people that I work with, everybody who's listening today, don't feel guilty for feeling full. You know, if you have to undo your button on your pants and take off your belt, then maybe you push it a little bit too far at the meal, but enjoy, leave your meal feeling full till you can feel like you can fast until your next meal or the next day when you intend to eat again. Um, and that's really important. And then I find that people still, when they're transitioning into this lifestyle, so maybe not people in the Keto Camp Academy, maybe their keto diet's a little bit better than some of the ones that I see, but there's still not a whole lot of nutrients going on in the diet. There's still real foods missing, still some processed foods lingering. And a lot of people come in to our program. We started doing some pretty intensive um, mineral and vitamin testing and found that a lot of people are really depleted like we have all these patients that are overnourished yet malnourished all at the same same time so it's really important to make sure that you are reading eating real food and so that's something that we really encourage people to do eat until you feel full don't feel guilty it will help you actually lose weight in the long run especially if you're eating a diet that's high in healthy fats, so that will actually raise your metabolic rate, um, which will make you then burn more when you're on a fasting day. It will help itself out. So enjoy those fats, embrace those fats, and, and eat real foods and, and try to get in a variety of real foods into your diet. And if you're you know, if you're still, like, if you're only eating beef, there's so many different parts of the beef, you know, really embrace the nose to tail lifestyle to make sure that you are getting a variety of nutrients in. And I have people that just eat beef that thrive. And I have people that just eat beef and flounder because they're not eating very nutrient dense parts of beef. And, and same with all diets, regardless of whether they're an omnivore uh, or they're a ketotarian <laughs> yeah. or anywhere in between. Yeah, I love it. I, I so agree with you. It's it's important because I believe our cells, all 70 trillion cells are designed for feast, famine cycles. And my coach, Dr. Pompa talks about it all the time. Feast, famine, cycle. Feast. So if we're just doing the fasting, 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 the famine, 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 we're going to be too catabolic and we're going to get too much autophagy. I mean, we don't want yeah. too much. We want a proper balance of mTOR and autophagy. There's an art to it. And that's what you guys teach over at the fasting method. So let's talk about the fasting method. Yeah. It used to be called IDM, Intensive Dietary Management. You rebranded. I love the new name. Tell us all about the fasting method. <laughs> so we found out that there is a clinic in Cambridge, UK, called Intensive Dietary Management that is the opposite of what we do. Um, so once we got catapulted to the international sta or stage, it was suggested that we might want to figure that out. Um, so we decided to make IDM our parent company, and we are fasting program, 
um, which was the IDM program, we would make it the fasting method program. And it's sure if you're if you're looking for fasting help, you're not going to be searching intensive dietary management. True. Uh, <laughs> so That's true. We're not we're we're doing a disservice to people by using that name, anyways. So with the fasting method, um, what we have is we have this on online program. It's got three pillars. It's got education, support, and community. So the education has fasting and eating courses taught by Jason and myself. And in the new year, um, some of our partners that are joining us, Dr. Nadira Lee, Dr. Tro, um, they're coming in to do some more advanced uh, lessons for us. Dr. Lee is going to do a whole educational series on autophagy and optimizing it. So we have our educational pillar. So you get a lesson, you get the transcript of the lesson, you get action points with every lesson to start implementing the tools that were uh, emphasized into your lifestyle. So you're, you're taught the why and then you're explained the how uh, in every lesson and then you get a quiz just to reinforce the knowledge. So that's our educational. So we have all these different courses for if you're brand new to fasting and just maybe want to go to the basics and cut out snacking or you've gone through your journey and now you're super well and healthy and want to start, you know, working out and learning more autophagy. We'll have some more educational materials for that end of the spectrum in 2020. And then we have a a whole bunch of stuff for the metabolic group. So obesity, the full spectrum of diabetes and type one diabetes, um, PCOS and fatty liver. And then um, in our support, uh, we have lots of live and interactive ways to support. So we do have handouts and sort of static stuff that stays there, um, but we have a monthly book or, or a book club. So the book club meets every Friday. Health books. Um, yeah, all health books. So we've already done the diabetes code and the obesity code. Uh, in the new year, we've got like the big fat surprise and like Nina's going to be a guest and Dr. Ali is going to be a guest. So every Friday we'll have, we'll try to get the author plus some of the, some other experts in the area. So we've got the big fat surprise um, going on in the month of January. Um, and we'll break down the science behind the books. We've got focus groups. So you can come together with like-minded peers and get a fasting coach to help you. We've got everything from basic intermittent fasting to fasting for women to we have a behavioral psychologist on our team, Dr. Terry Lance, and she runs four behavioral modification groups with slightly different themes every week. So if there's a certain area you're struggling with, like maybe the paradigm shift and you're scared to eat fat. She's got a, a class every week that you can join and learn some tools to help you ad adapt psychologically. We've got a group fasting challenge going on every week. Um, we cycle through four, uh, so from beginner to advanced, so there's something going on for everybody every month. Or you could just simply join them all to keep things mixed mixed up. Dr. Fung does a live meetup where he answers uh, answers questions to our listeners. I do one monthly and Dr. Ali is going to start doing them once a month too in the new year. So pretty much every week um, we have a live meetup with Jason, myself, or Dr. Nadira Lee, which is, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it sounds like an awesome freaking program. Where can they learn more about it? Uh, fasting, the fasting method.com. So all of our info's there. And if you wanted some more personal advice, you've got some cool coaches, uh, uh, who have all had their own incredible transformation that can help you out too. Yeah. I interviewed Carolyn McCann last week for the Academy and her story was amazing. So we're running out of time. I want to acknowledge you, Megan, and say, thank you so much for your knowledge. You are the fasting queen. I can't wait for your, <laughs> your book. The Women in Fasting will have you back on the show and you are just thank brilliant. You. I love the work that you're doing and thank you for your time today. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Ben. And thank you for all of your support. We love the work you're doing too.